I'm really excited about this evening's program. Um, this is an opportunity for us to talk a little bit about the shared security document. But it's also an opportunity for you to hear directly from FCNL's frontline of program lobbyists um, about what they are doing specifically with regard to shared security. You guys ready to go? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so I hope all of you have seen these documents. They're not the same thing. One is called Shared Security Reimagining U.S. Foreign Policy. It's a working paper of the American Friends Service Committee and Friends Committee on National Legislation. And the other one is a little bit thinner, and it is a discussion guide for friends. If you haven't seen these, you might want to pick up a set before you leave today and take it back to your meeting because we have, as you might expect, an assignment for you. <laughs> so. Shared security, reimagining U.S. foreign policy, another way to put it that we've said here is, what do we as Quakers think is the way forward for the world we seek? Many of you spent a good part of yesterday, was it just yesterday you lobbied? Many of you spent a good part of yesterday talking to your members of Congress about curbing military spending by a trillion dollars over a decade. FCNL has been pushing to rebalance our federal priorities away from Pentagon spending and redirected toward the peaceful prevention of deadly conflict and toward human needs, both in the U.S. and internationally, for really a long time. In fact, we have a vision for the world we seek. It's a world free of war and the threat of war. It's a society with equity and justice for all. It's a community where every person's potential may be fulfilled, and it's an earth restored. This is our prophetic witness. And then there's the pragmatic day-to-day -day work that we do in and out on Capitol Hill and that we ask you to participate in in being in contact with your members of Congress. About a year ago, maybe even probably a little bit longer than that, uh, we began to talk about what is it that we as friends have to say right now about peace and conflict, about human security, about climate crisis, and what might be an ethical and effective way for the U.S. to engage with the rest of the world. So we began to draft a working paper. It was led by Bridget Moix and Ora Kanegas, two former FCNL program assistants, Bridget had just left FCNL to work on her PhD program, and Aura, who's joined us tonight, heads the AFSC Washington office. We be they began by drafting and sending this out to a number of people who have been working with AFSC and FCNL over, over many years, um, people who have expertise in international issues, foreign policy, international security to get their, their input. And the, the document through, went through many revisions. We had a consultation in April to begin discussing this framework. Within the first couple of hours of that Pendle Hill consultation, there were 35 people in the room. We were talking about our notions of human security, how the world is changing, how the nature of war and conflict is changing. And almost in the sense that this sometimes happens, the terms shared security emerged as the, as the talking uh, framework for how we would envision this. The discussion of the people in that room was informed by a variety of experiences and perspectives, including the dean of a business school, an analyst working in the secretary in the office of the Secretary of Defense, longtime peace and justice advocates, and weighty friends. In late May of this year, we mailed this, so, this shared security document and discussion guide to, I think, about 800 meetings across the country, uh, and meetings and churches. We've set up a blog called sharedsecurity.org to encourage a lively dialogue about the immediate questions before us and how the shared security lens informs the decisions that we might make into public policy. We also wrote an epistle out of that consultation. I'm going to just call out a couple of lines from that epistle. We must move beyond war is not the answer toward providing positive understanding of a new foreign policy. 
The second line I want to call out from the epistle is one that you'll be hearing a lot about, and you've probably, and you'll especially tomorrow night in, in during our annual meeting, and is this. As we move forward, grounded in the faith and practice of friends, we rededicate ourselves to continuing to embrace the diverse voices and gifts of our global community of Quakers and to deepening part the participation and leadership of our younger members. And in particular, when we assembled the people at that consultation, it included people who had a lot of expertise and who had been working in this field for a while, but we also included people who were younger and newer to the, to the work because we thought it was important to get a perspective that wasn't only based on, on decades and decades of experience. Tonight you're going to hear from our lobbyists on the Hill how their day-to-day -day work informs and shapes some of the ideas that are already in the shared security document. You're going to see opportunities for where we can advance uh, some of the, the four principles that are talked about in the document. And you'll hear many challenges of the long way we have to go. Following the brief remarks from each of the members of the panel, we're going to open it up to questions from you. Our hope is to engage as many of you and as many questions as we can in the time we have tonight. So the process we're going to use, uh, we'll have mic runners when we open it up. I'm going to ask for a couple of questions, and then we'll ask uh, probably a couple of people to respond as appropriate. We'd like to give everyone about the same amount of time on the panel. I'm going to briefly introduce the panel here, and I'll be a timekeeper. Um, and again, you'll notice our missing um, head lobbyist, Ruth Flower who is busy working with uh, the policy committee. Ruth, of course, deals with a lot of the domestic issues, um, immigration, uh, Native American issues, a lot of civil rights, and the federal budget. Um, Tila is going to be speaking about the federal budget, and the, uh, Jose is going to be talking about environmental policy, and most of the rest of these folks work on foreign policy. So immediately here, this is Tila Nuguse. She is our legislative associate on uh, the federal budget, poverty issues. David Culp, who many of you know, who's been at FCNL for many years, working on nuclear disarmament. Um, the Kate Gould, who is our Middle East Legislative Associate. Matt Southworth, uh, Foreign Policy Le Legislative Associate. Um, Madeline Rose, Foreign Policy Legislative Associate. Jose Aguto, a Legislative uh, Representative for Environment and Energy. And Michael Shank, Director of Foreign Policy. And with that, I'll turn it over to Tila. You guys can talk from there if you want. Do you oh, want to stay okay. there? Or you want to stay there? It doesn't matter. Okay, stand come. Okay. <laughs> so when I think about shared security, um, it's a document that explicitly deals with our problematic militarized foreign policy. Um, they, Diane asked if we would share stories that, um, about how shared security informs the work that we do at FCNL. So like Diane said, and like I've said, I work on the budget here at FCNL. And I think you can't have a, a conversation about our militarized foreign policy without talking about the size and scope of our very, very large military budget. Um, so I'm reminded actually of a story about when I was actually working um, at another organization before I came to FCNL. I was working at a small uh, nonprofit in St. Louis and I was doing lobbying on military spending work. I came up to deliver signatures, I came to DC from St. Louis to deliver signatures on a letter um, where we were asking to cut military spending and fund our communities. It was a very basic ask. ask. Um, we met with one of our representatives who's no longer in office. He was a fairly progressive Democrat on the Foreign, uh, Foreign Affairs Committee. And his staff person was agreeing with most of what we had to say. She agreed that the military budget was too large and that we could spend the money elsewhere. But I was really taken aback by um, her, one of her reactions. And this was, she kind of chastised us. She, um, like I said, she resonated with most of what she said, what we said. But she advised us that we sounded a little isolationist in our language and approach to the issue of cutting military spending. Um, she said that we had to make sure to draw a clear connection between cutting military spending to not only fund local and domestic human needs programs, but also to fund foreign, foreign assistance and diplomatic endeavors, um, that we had to incorporate that aspect into our messaging um, because it made us sound a little bit isolationist. So I was really taken aback because I worked for this progressive peace and justice group and I thought, that's not what we're saying at all, you know? Um, but it was very eye-opening. She let us know that as we were uh, weaving this narrative, for reducing military spending, 
that we had left out one key essential component, and that was the concept that's discussed in shared security. In our work on the budget, as many of you have probably heard me say before, we talk about the federal budget as a moral document, and as such, it should be crafted to fit our priorities as a nation. Um, our budget work advocates for, just as we lobbied for yesterday, um, and thank you all for lobbying so much yesterday, um, for a budget that reflects our priorities as a nation and reflects the real needs that we need. The, this nation's rampant military spending is one of the biggest threats to what I will call true human security. And I, I feel that true human security is that form of national security where we know that people aren't going to bed hungry, that people have a place to lay their head down, and that we all can share in the prosperity of a system to which we all contribute and all benefit from. Um, with only 5% of the world's population, uh, the U.S accounts for 45%, which is almost half of the world's military expenditures. And yet we have UNICEF rating us last year in May of 2012 as having the second lar largest child poverty rate of a developed nation. And that doesn't sound like true human security to me. Uh, another threat to our national security really is, I mean, a, the biggest threat, I'll say again, is our unbalanced and unjust federal spending priorities. Um, there is another way. We don't have to spend so much on the military. I think if we make those domestic investments into education, clean energy, and health, these are more cost effective and they contribute more to that long-term security and well-being of our communities than it does if we invest only in military endeavors. Um, and the last thing I'll say is that the Pentagon does suffer from this lack of a clear mission. And because it has the most plush budget in our discretionary spending, you often see that it has this overarching mission. So the Pentagon is engaging in endeavors that might be better done by um, the State Department or USAID diplomatic efforts that the Pentagon is now taking uh, control over because it has the most money. Uh, but now we see the budget uncertainty in Congress is calling the Pentagon to actually take a deep look into what's a more clear and appropriate mission. And these conversations have already begun to take place uh, amongst Pentagon officials. They are seeing the power of their unlimited purse dwindling, and they have to think more wisely about what they're doing, about if they should be doing it, and about how much it actually costs. And this is how we can use the budget as a crux, crux for us to insert ourselves in this conversation, as the staffer in Missouri, in the Missouri office, reminded me about how we reorient our U.S. foreign policy from a military to a more civilian side. Um, I think we can make investments in shared security and true human security simultaneously, and I think it's our moral imperative to do so. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> I'm not bashful. My name is David Culp, and as most of you know, uh, most of the time I work on nuclear disarmament issues, but I'm going to be talking about our Syria campaign. Uh, Kate does the Middle East most of the time, but she's got another story on Iran, so I'm going to talk about Syria, which I was deeply involved in. As I'm sure all of you remember, in late August, headline news, uh, chemical weapons used in Syria. And about a week later, President Obama gave a Rose Garden speech where he announced that he was going to Congress for the authorization for the use of force against Syria. That Monday morning following that Saturday speech, we had a staff meeting up on the third floor at FCNL. What are we going to do? And we made the decision that we could um, win this uh, campaign and defeat the legislation, uh, that we were going to pull out all of the stops to do that. Um, soon after we had our staff meeting, though, uh, the Speaker of the House came out in favor of the resolution. And soon after that, the uh, chief Democrat in the House, Minority Leader Pelosi, came out in favor of the resolution. So we had the President, the uh, Secretary of Defense, the Secretary of State, the Speaker of the House, the Minority Leader of the House, all lined up uh, in favor of military action against Syria. Uh, but we decided that we could win, and we pulled out all the stops. Um, Madeline Rose uh, put together a, a quick letter to the Hill, what are the alternatives to war, because already we were getting phone calls from congressional staff. Um, 
Jim started cranking out multiple action alerts to all of you. But probably our biggest accomplishment was a very intensive phone bank. We brought back uh, some of the program assistants that had left at the end of July. We stopped all of our um, program assistant training for the new year. Pretty much we scrapped all of our uh, schedules for several weeks, brought in some volunteers, and we're phone banking close to 24-7. That's a slight exaggeration, but not by much. Uh, in staff volunteer evenings and weekends. And we put together a list of about 60 house uh, districts to focus on because we had a short amount of time. So that those are the districts we focused on, and we called you, and we got tremendous response. And just like you heard last night from Reza Aslan, when he was doing phone banking 15 years ago at FCNL, and he explained the tremendous response he got, we got exactly the same response. Uh, we would tell you that we're from FCNL. We didn't even get through our message. What do you want us to do? And not only uh, our constituents, but the peace movement as a whole. Uh, we generated thousands of phone calls and letters into the House of Representatives. Many representatives said that they got 80% or 90% of the phone calls opposed to going to war. The long and the short, you know the end of the story. Um, skillful diplomacy was applied. Um, there was an agreement where Syria would uh, join the Chemical Weapons Convention and agree to destroy its weapons. Uh, the resolution never came to a vote in the, either the House or the Senate. This is the little secret that nobody knows. Uh, they were so far behind, they wouldn't even bring it up for a vote in either the House or the Senate. Um, and where, how does this fit back to the document that we're talking about, shared security? Uh, if you haven't seen it, there's a stack of these back here on the back table. And principle number one is peaceful, peaceful ends through peaceful means. Principle number three is global cooperation and rule of law. This campaign could have been uh, a case study in this uh, report. These principles really are baked into our DNA of the FCNL staff and yourselves. Um, and I just want to share with you why I think this was a successful campaign and also what needs to be done. One is we have a very strong field program. Second, an experienced legislative staff. Third, and this is important, we have clear policy on this. There wasn't any debate as to what were we for or against bombing Syria. We already knew that answer. But the most important thing, the most important asset was your response. Your response and your friends and colleagues and the peace movement, it was tremendous. Uh, and without you, we would have gone to war with Syria in September. What is missing? In my opinion, um, more persistent diplomacy, more skillful diplomacy, more effective diplomacy. The State Department's budget has been frozen for years. They don't even bring their bill up for a vote because they're afraid it's gonna get slashed to pieces. Uh, the State Department has limited support in Congress. That's just the truth. And we still, even though the, the president uh, said that he's going to turn a new leaf, this was part of his campaign in 2008, he still has a tendency to turn to the Secretary of Defense rather than the Secretary of State when faced with a crisis. It's the Secretary of Defense who's got the resources, just as Tila said. There's a complete mismatch. Even former Defense Secretary Gates said the same thing. Complete mismatch between the Defense Department and the State Department. So those are the things that I think that we have to change if we are going to see uh, a shared security agenda implemented in the United States. Great. Yeah, so that unprecedented grassroots opposition to a U.S. war on Syria, that didn't just stop a vote, and it didn't just stop the U.S. from bombing another country. 
it has actually changed the U.S. discourse and, and U.S. policy toward Syria, toward the Middle East, and toward the world in some very significant ways. So don't just take my word for it. Um, for example, when Senator Lindsey Graham, uh, this was a few weeks after the Syria authorization for the use of military force vote was averted. Um, a few weeks after that, Senator Lindsey Graham committed to bringing up an authorization for the use of military force against Iran. And, you know, I thought this was pretty unbelievable, um, but, but he was very serious about it. He said he's bringing it to the floor, and I talked to a number of staffers about it, and, um, and I remember one staffer said, you know, I think that's really not going to fly because we, all of the staff assistants on Capitol Hill will just leave at that point. Like, they are tired of answering those phone calls. Uh, <laughs> staff assistants are, are usually the ones to answer phone calls on, in Hill offices, and, um, and they were just picking up the phone and turning down and picking up the phone again to answer another call against bombing Syria. So he was right. Um, the staffer, and it nev the AUMF, Authorization for the Use of Military Force, get used to that acronym, you're going to hear it a lot, <laughs> um, it, it, against Iran, it never came up for a vote. And I don't think it will, um, because that grassroots opposition to another war was felt. And, and Capitol Hill got the message that they weren't just talking, you all weren't just talking about Syria, you just don't really want the U.S. to start bombing another country. Um, so this tidal wave of grassroots opposition to another war it helped force open the door for a diplomatic solution to peacefully disarm Syria of its chemical weapons stockpile. Um, or that's what's happening today, and that's the kind of trajectory that we're on. It also helped create the political space for President Obama to do the unthinkable in terms of, of looking at conflict in the Middle East. It, it created the space for him to pick up the phone and talk to President Rouhani, talk to the president of Iran. Such a simple phone call was so significant, it shook the world because it signaled a shift from the militarized U.S. response that Tila talked about toward an approach that's rooted in global cooperation and aligned with our vision of shared security. And right now, this moment, the U.S. and Iran are within reach of a historic nuclear deal, a deal that will help guard against a nuclear-armed Iran and prevent another war. We've never been this close. U.S. and Iranian diplomats have a chance to seal the deal on Wednesday when they meet again for another round of talks. But even before our diplomats have a chance to pack their bags for Geneva, the Senate, believe it or not, they're thinking of voting on another sanctions bill. They could sabotage um, a, a nuclear deal by pushing forward with more sanctions, more sa saber rattling. And there's an intense debate about this right now. So, of course, your senators need to hear from you. They need to hear from you about this. They need to hear from you um, over the long term because, as we often like to say, um, diplomacy, it's, it's a marathon. It's not a sprint. This, what the U.S. and Iranian negotiators are looking at is the first phase of a comprehensive deal. It's going to take a while to get there. There's going to be a lot of hardliners on all sides um, in the U.S., Iran, and other countries who are going to try to sabotage a deal, as we've seen before. So they'll need to hear from you, and that's what our Iran program is focused on right now, is, is ensuring that we seize this historic opportunity to secure a deal with Iran that means so much, that could mean so much for stabilizing the Middle East and for bringing us closer to a world where we see our shared security values lived out. So. Diane told us we had three minutes, but you may have noticed it's hard to get a lobbyist to speak for only three minutes. I'll, uh, I'll do my best. 
I need to actually, can you all, can you all hear me? Everyone hear me? No? Better here? Okay, so uh, I need to take a survey because that's how I operate. I'm curious, who's heard of the war in Afghanistan? Raise your hand. <laughs> okay, looks like 100%. Uh, Guantanamo Bay, anybody? Okay, all right, we're tracking, all right. Uh, the new drones base in Niger, new drones base in Niger. Ooh, that's, mm, okay. Uh, that's like 10%. I'll give you, a, I'll, I'll bump you up a little bit. How about, uh, how about let's say, um, drone strikes in Yemen? That's a, that's a popular one. Okay, so all of this is made possible by the 2001 authorization of the use of military force. Oh, I forgot. Stand up if you think raising your hand is silly. Anyone? Anyone? <laughs> no, okay. All right, so no, no takers on that. Everyone likes to raise their hand. Good. So, you know, one of the tenets of this document, David mentioned it earlier, is peaceful ends through peaceful means. It's what Joe Volk used to talk about um, when he talked about peace in the world. I served a, a tour of duty in Iraq. I know from firsthand experience that peace does not come from war. The only thing that comes from war is death and destruction. Think about the last 12 years. I know I'm preaching to the choir, but I'm going to throw it out there anyway. <laughs> the choir sometimes needs tuning, you know. Um, think about these last 12 years. We have uh, over 6,000 US troops killed in action. We have over 100,000 wounded in action. The VA estimates that they're dealing with somewhere around 420,000 traumatic brain injuries and post-traumatic stress disorder cases. I am one of those post-traumatic stress disorder cases. Uh, we have spent $1.4 trillion in operational costs. $1.4 trillion. Tiela, do we need some of that in poverty? Do we? I think we do. <laughs> We've spent a tremendous amount of money, four, point, uh, four to six trillion dollars in the long term. This is to say nothing of the 29 million uh, Afghans and the 25 million Iraqi, Iraqis who have all been affected. 2.5% of the population in this country, 100% of the population in Afghanistan, 100% of the population in Iraq have been affected. We have over uh, probably four to six million uh, displaced and killed in Iraq and Afghanistan. And you have to look at that and ask yourself, are we really safer? Is the US really more secure? Is the world more secure? I think we could agree if I took another survey that we probably aren't. So what does that mean? What does this sort of mean for our work and the peaceful ends through peaceful means? Well, all of these policies, just about, Iraq was, had a separate uh, authorization of the use of force, but almost all of these policies, we're talking drone strikes, counterterrorism around the world, expansion of bases into Africa, uh, the, loss of the loss of the ability to do true dip uh, diplomacy, Guantanamo, the war in Afghanistan, and government spying. All of them happen under the auspices of the authorization of the use of military force, uh, a law passed in 2001. We have a unique opportunity here because the war in Afghanistan is ending. 2014, President Obama is supposed to bring home uh, the majority, if not all, US troops from Afghanistan. We can bookend the global war on terror. We can finally put an end to these policies. And I know some of you are thinking, yeah, right, that's a really nice dream, but once you get something like this, it doesn't go away. However, the House voted this July, 185 members of the House, Democrats and Republicans, voted to repeal that law. Uh, do the math, we are 32 to 35 votes away from passing a repeal of the authorization of the use of force. We can do it, but we need your help. There are two opportunities coming up. One is in February. You can lobby in district. You can uh, contact me or Catherine Phillipson or Elizabeth Beavers to talk more about that. Uh, I have written you all a love note. It is uh, in the back of the room on the first table on the left, and uh, it details some of the things you need to know to be able to lobby in February and some of the reasons why I think this is a good time to do that. The other opportunity for young friends in the room, uh, you, you can actually come back to Washington, D.C. in March and participate in FCNL's Spring Lobby Weekend, where the effort we're going to try to engage in is ending um, the authorization of the use of force and, um, and trying to eliminate U.S. drone strikes. That's an opportunity for everyone in the room, because if you're a young friend, you're encouraged to attend. If you're an older friend or even young at heart, you're encouraged to support someone who wants to attend. Uh, so we look forward to uh, being able to do that. We really want to pack the Hill with young lobbyists looking to end these policies. We think we can get 200 people, but we need your help to do it. This is really the time. Over the next few months, we have a very small window to repeal this, uh, this law and end some of the worst policies in my lifetime. Thank you.
heart is racing from just listening to that. Yeah. Oh. Um, so I'm relatively new to Friends Committee. I joined the staff in mid-July. And so when we were thinking about what stories we were going to tell, I thought about my first week at FCNL. And my second day on staff, I had my first, uh, which is now one of many, uh, Quaker collaboration phone calls. So the Quaker collaboration phone calls were started on when, over the past 18 months, when friends have been working very closely with Kenyan Quakers to prevent election violence in advance of the 2013 elections in Kenya. So, you know, I'm, I'm here, I'm on day two. I don't know much about these Quaker phone calls, but I jump on a call. At, unknown to me, we have folks from uh, Quaker Peace Social Network. We have people from African Great Lakes Initiative based in Kenya and Burundi. We have uh, folks from the Quaker UN office in New York and in Geneva. We have folks from American Friends Service Committee on the phone. We have folks from the Friends Church Peace Team from Kenya. Uh, and then we had a, couple of, a few handful of us in DC. And so we were, uh, it was July, it had been a few months after the March elections in Kenya had, had uh, completed, and I was just calling to ask, so, you know, what, what did you do? How did this whole project work? Um, and my question, what I asked was, um, what did we learn? What did, what did we learn from the Kenyan experience, and where, where do you want to go forward? Mm -hmm. um, and what they said was, and so, we, so first we had our, our folks, our colleagues from Kenya speak, and they said what we learned was that preventing violence is possible. Um, the country was sorely, sorely traumatized from the 2008, the 2007, 2008 election cycle where uh, over 1,000 Kenyans were killed in the immediate uh, few weeks after the elections. Um, and they had a coordinated campaign of, based with, uh, on Quaker values of, of preventing election violence for 2013. They said, and it worked. The, the elections were largely peaceful. It was a coordinated strategy and they felt very, very empowered by this realization that their strategy worked. The second thing they said they learned was that what they told me was that FCNL's role in this process was critical. And having the US government involved all along the way really, really changed them and gave them a sense of hope. Um, the, the resolution that Senator uh, Coons introduced in talking about the US support for community-based elections for ends and violence, she said they, she laminated that resolution and carried it around with her when she did trainings. Um, and uh, the third thing that they learned is that, which is also very Quaker I've learned, is that we have a lot of work to do. And they said, you know, it, it was too isolated, it was too small, we could have done more, we needed to reach more people, you know, we could have built, built the network bigger, we, we, we needed to, to, to collaborate, we needed to make this a bigger model, we needed to engage more people so that we can continue to build peace and continue to address root cause issues. Um, and that we can't just focus on elections, but we have to really restore people's faith and restore trust in government and address the root cause issues. And I said, okay, so what next? And Unanimously on the phone, they said, we want to support our Quaker colleagues in Burundi. Um, so uh, Burundi is the, has the second largest concentration of Quakers of any African country. And Burundi uh, suffered a, a long civil war, um, which led to a genocide in the early 1990s uh, between the Hutus and Tutsis. And they held their first uh, post-conflict elections in 2005, um, but it wasn't really participatory. And then they had another series of elections in 2010 that also was marred by violence. And so they're preparing for their 2015 elections, and they wanted to, um, you know, the Kenyans wanted to make sure that they supported their colleagues in Burundi. And so I said, Okay, well, uh, let's think about how we can do that. And so with a couple of colleagues, um, we ended up pulling together a proposal for a grant to uh, host a transnational lessons learned collaborative gathering on early warning and early response systems to prevent electoral violence. That was literally the title of my grant, which is like a three, which is a three line title, which probably they didn't appreciate, but I mean, that's what it was. So uh, we did, we got a $15,000 grant. It was turned around in about three weeks and we were able to sp support a, to co-host a, a dialogue between uh, 22 different Burundian civil society organizations, our Kenyan Quakers, um, from the Friends Church Peace Team, a early warning, early response uh, leader from Liberia, an early warning, early response expert from Nigeria, uh, some uh, peace builders from the UK, and myself and one colleague from George Mason's Genocide Prevention Program uh, here in DC. We all came together for a workshop in Burundi in September. Uh, to talk about what Burundi was seeing as key issues uh, ahead of their 2015 elections and what they can do to, to build on the Kenya's experience and build on lessons learned and make sure that we really, you know, both build on that model and replicate it, but also target it to address 
um, the root causes in Burundi that are unique to the situation. And f since that gathering, um, there is now a coalition of 30 different Burundian organizations that have come together uh, and had two different follow-up workshops. They've drafted a memorandum of understanding about building a network. They're engaging, they have had meetings with the US Embassy that we've set up, um, and they're building a network. And what was really, really, really amazing to hear them say and talk about when they were talking about their goals was that they said, you know, we don't want to just, we can't focus just on the elections. We have to focus on the root causes of, of of trauma and and violence and um, issues that are continuing to um, spark violence in our community that yes will be exacerbated during the elections period, but actually, you know, transcend they're, they're transcendent beyond just elections. So we have to build a network that is sustainable that addresses root causes, involves trauma healing, involves alternative to violence trainings for youth, it connects you know both our youth to our el to uh, you know ex-combatants who did fight in the in the civil wars. Um, so it's, it's this bi much bigger coalition that is now coming together, um, kind of building on this Kenyan model. And so what, when we returned and kind of how that fits more into uh, our direct lobbying, um, immediately when, when I got home, um, I set up some meetings with the administration and the, the U.S. State Department, the White House, and the uh, U.S. AID is looking at Burundi as their first ever um, upstream prevention case study and how the USG can take a whole of government approach to proactively preventing potential mass atrocities. Um, and so we are helping them write that strategy of what that would look like. Uh, we then went to the Senate and the House. Um, no, uh, we, it was, it was I. Uh, I, I went to the Senate and the House. Um, if I, I was thinking we's. Mm -hmm. And um, to told him about this trip and said, you know, Bernie's coming up and the USG was so engaged in Kenya, let's make sure we harness that knowledge. And so they both said, oh, that's great. They're setting up a house uh, of mem members um, delegation visit to, to the Great Lakes region and they're gonna go to Burundi next year. They said they're gonna ha ha um, host um, both House and Senate hearings on elections in Burundi. We're also working on pulling together a US Institute of Peace uh, event on lessons learned from Kenya and the Burundi to learn from Kenya and look forward to Burundi, um, and just kind of con using this case study to highlight how U.S. government funding, how U.S. government programs can better address, um, you know, the root cause issues of conflict that will actually restore persons and restore communities and build peace that is sustainable. Um, so it's kind of both the real time example of supporting these, these Quakers and help building up their voice, but also connecting it, that to, connecting it back to the structural issues that we have lobbied for for decades, so. Thank you. Let me see, is that on? Yes. Um, I'm going to shift course a, a little bit because, um, as um, many of you know, in Congress uh, there isn't a bipartisan acknowledgement of the actual phenomenon of climate disruption. <laughs> so we're still working on that uh, initial acknowledgement because, based on um, a tenant from Alcoholics Anonymous, you cannot solve a problem unless you first admit it. <laughs> um, and so we're actually working um, to um, reaching out to moderates on both sides to speak from a faith perspective, um, trying to depoliticize this issue as well as depoliticize the, the, the rancor around the issue and, and foster a cooperative engagement um, and a willingness of both parties to come together and acknowledge that reality. Um, and once they do so, then we can talk about meaningful legislative changes um, and so that is where we are um, from, um, you know, from, a, from a lobbying perspective. And I wanted to put that in the frame of the sh shared security document, and in particular, um, the uh, planetary imperative, which is one of, the three p one of the four pillars. We absolutely have a planetary imperative to dramatically and urgently reduce global greenhouse gas emissions. We are nowhere near that goal, and one of the reasons we are not is because we simply, as a, as a global community, are not wrapped around the shared values that many of you have and that many indigenous peoples have with regard to how we treat the earth. Um, and many of these values are reflected in this document, and it is very heartwarming to see more and more human beings understand what it is that indigenous peoples have said since first contact with regard to our treatment of the earth. That we do not inherit the earth 
from our ancestors. We borrow it from our children. Um, those of you who may have read some Dr. Seuss to your children and grandchildren, remember the Lorax. It's, these are the same values, and they sound very simple, um, but they are absolutely essential if we are to prevent the planetary collapse um, that many scientists are uh, predicting that we are already experiencing. Um, it's about intergenerational justice. And I was reminded of an anecdote when I was up in Alaska with the Alaska um, friends um, of the Iroquois Confederacy, which has existed for over a thousand years. And there were six nations within the Iroquois Confederacy. And as they sat around the fire discussing um, policy, there was actually seven seats and that last seat was empty. And oftentimes when they were coming close to a decision, one of the chiefs would point to that seat and say, what about him? And that is the seventh generation. We absolutely need, not just in this room, but all of the decision makers, all of the policy makers at every single realm of leadership to embrace this. Because if we do not, as the IMF head, Christine Lagarde said at Davos in February, if we do not deal with climate change, our children and future generations will be roasted, toasted, fried and grilled. This is the head of the IMF. So um, how do we move forward? And I mentioned that, um, that moral imperative that the interfaith community is trying to bring to the table. We are appealing to um, our representatives as human beings, as mothers and fathers, as grandfathers and grandmothers. This is really where we need to start as a human community. Um, and just to bring this, and also very excited about a lot of the work that Ed has done and, and Keith has done and F Phil will be doing with regard to um, what is a proper way that we gauge economic productivity. Um, how do we define gross national product? And I know that Michael has done a lot of great work on, on that. Let's get redefinitions out there. Let's bring forth what Kenneth Boulding was talking about when he talked about a spaceship economy, not a cowboy economy, where we just simply rape the earth for our own benefit and not acknowledge the, the damage that we do, not only to all of, all of our relations, but also ourselves as, um, as human beings. How's it, how, does this, how does this manifest in our work right now, and as well as that interfaith uh, call that we are, we are engaging in? Um, Emily is working on what happened in Syria before the actual, before we got to where we are today, where we are analyzing the fact that there was a drought of unprecedented nature, of an unprecedented nature that was probably climate induced between 2006 and 2011 which resulted in uh, an 80% decimation of Syrian agriculture and 800,000 people moving from what was the Fertile Crescent into the cities. Um, that's 800,000 people out of a population of 26 million. So you can imagine how that might foment increasing social unrest. Many pundits didn't think that uh, Syria would be part of the Arab Spring, but we are starting to analyze how that climate-induced drought may have helped foment that kind of uprising in Syria. Um, and so if we can inflect that into future foreign policy positions and understand the nexus between climate and conflict, then we perhaps are getting somewhere with regard to addressing climate disruption and its root causes, both from an economic and an energy and a social and a moral perspective. Um, and then lastly, um, we're also now exploring, because there's some research out there, how we can have shared peace, sustainable peace, based on agreements around natural resources. Um, there have been some good models out there. You actually can see um, around the Jordan River um, cooperation amongst Palestinians and Israelis and Jordanians because they're talking about a shared natural resource which transcends sectarian and religious um, ideologies. It's a fundamental. Um, and with these kinds of natural resource agreements, there is a, um, a prevention of conflict um, as well as a shared uh, peace following conflict. And so we're investigating this as a pathway to peace. Um, so thank you for your time.
right. Let's, uh, I want us to jump into Q&A as quickly as possible because we have probably an under an hour to chat, but I'll say a few quick things. How grateful I am to be with this incredible team. You can tell we cover a lot and somehow they remain uh, capable of breaking a smile throughout all of it because it's very <laughs> daunting stuff. When I was thinking about my dissertation, my doctoral dissertation, I was gonna choose either climate change or war on terrorism. And one of my advisors was like, well, choose the more hopeful one. And I was like, well, I don't know which is the more hopeful one. And I ended up <laughs> choosing climate change um, because I just thought we could do more there rather than war on terrorism. It felt like it was an older conversation. So I ended up choosing climate change. I don't know if I've remained more hopeful, but hashtag shared security. Um, yesterday I was with the main team and Ed and Jim and Becky and Gray, I've see, I see some of you here tonight, props to you for bringing up shared security throughout all of the conversations with the members. And there was some initial resonance, some nodding, but here's where we need to, as a community, go further. And I want to thank Aura and Bridget for their incredible work on the shared security document and for the team for fleshing out the four pillars. I just want to reiterate the four pillars again. Peaceful ends through peaceful means, planetary imperative, global cooperation and the rule of law, lastly, restorative justice, not restorative justice, restorative approaches to heal a broken world. And so you can see how all of this work fits within these four pillars. What we need to do to go further, rather than just kind of saying hashtag shared security or shared security is the way to go, which I like it, it's glass half full, but as a former congressional staffer, now we need to get into the, the nuts and bolts, the gritty, um, the granularity, the texture. What does that mean on a day-to-day -day basis? And you can tell the team is thinking through this on a day-to-day -day basis. It's kind of like a journalist, when you read a journalist, let's say they're writing an article about immigration, they won't lead a good journalist for the New York Times or, I was gonna say USA Today, but I don't consider that a quality paper, so I, I actually write for it, but I, uh, is they'll, they'll start saying, Jose is struggling with this and this and this. They'll go out and they'll zoom macro about midway through, talk about the trends, the policies, and then they'll probably, if they're a good journalist, or if this is for TV, you see this a lot in TV, they'll end with something about Jose. And so they pull you in with a story, they zoom out, talk about the trends, and then they close, bringing you back to Jose. So too with the shared security document, the framework is there, now it's our job to tell that micro, because the macro is there, and I think that's where it's not difficult. On some issues, it's easier. Think about nukes. If you've seen Countdown to Zero, you almost get panicky watching it, because you realize how easy it is to acquire nuclear fissile material. And they, and they show you how easy it is to get it. So too with drones. So many countries have drones. Unless we have, number three, global cooperation rule of law, anyone can have a drone. And a program that we're working on at FCNL is the 1033 program, it's in the Pentagon, which takes Pentagon equipment, gives it to city police forces. So now they're acquiring MRAPs, which is a mine resistant, ambush protected vehicle, which you see in Afghanistan, it doesn't belong on the city streets of America. It doesn't belong in Afghanistan, but it doesn't belong in the city streets of America. But they're acquiring drones too. Everyone's getting, Annie, get your gun, everyone's getting a drone. So too with climate change, carbon pollution from India, from China, it impacts us here. Our carbon pollution impacts them. Some of these topics are very compelling for shared security, framework, macro. Some, it takes a little extra work. That's our job. Lastly, I just want to, I just want to give an extra plug for the blog, which Diane spoke to. Aura and I are starting to host a kind of a question of the month. And we'd like it to be a question of the week, where we're creating a space for both AFSC and FCNL to converse, and then hopefully in the future, more generally, people who buy into the idea of shared security who want it. And, and given that I've come from the conflict community with my studies, I've been through the human security framework, and I've seen it kind of rise and fall and be effective in some environments and less effective in others. I actually think the shared security framework has even stronger potential. So I think we need to work it out, flesh it out. We've got the macro, let's build the micro, and let's get into Q&A. <laughs> Okay, so um, 
Alicia and Andrew are our mic runners tonight, and what we'd like to do is take um, a couple questions at a time, and uh, if you want to direct it to a specific lobbyist, you can do that, or if you want just a general response um, from anyone, we can do that. So we'd like to hear what you think about what your questions are, either about the work that's happening or about how the work that's happening fits into shared security. Pretty much anything. Nancy. Nancy Milio. Uh, this is uh, for Madeline, I think. You may not like it at all. <laughs> uh, and I hate to start off on a negative, but it, well, I'll be positive. I see a wonderful document and, and your uh, a wonderful document and your um, and your uh, examples have been very helpful. Um, but given your sense of achievement in Kenya, what happened? to you and friends in Kenya after the Nairobi massacre. How do you figure that? Yeah. Okay, wait, before we answer that, do we have another question? Does anybody else want to pose another one? Just, okay, in the back, Alicia. Please, uh, please do introduce yourself when you Just introduce yourself. David Kelm from the Chicago meeting. Um, in reading over the uh, shared security statement, I am uh, wondering why we would choose to support a rule of law and policing as opposed to the rule of law and peace facilitators. Okay. So um, let's take one more David up here. Uh, Andrew, can you come over to David? And then um, think about who's going to answer that one about rule of law. Uh, this is for David Rush from Cambridge Meeting in Cambridge, Massachusetts. It's for David Culp. Uh, what has happened to the fissile material r relationship with Russia? Are we still collecting their loose fissile material? I haven't heard much about this at all in the last several years. One thing that has kind of come up in the field of violence prevention in general was both looking at the, the, the positive opportunities of uh, mobilizing the international community around elections because they're flashy, they're you know both flashy from news perspective, they're easy, it's a benchmark, um, you can plan towards a date, uh, it's also a flash point and it exacerbates underlying tensions of conflict that already exist in communities. Um, and so there was, over the past 10 years, there has been this, this movement towards the international community mobilizing and, and sending, you know, the Swiss send um, uh, peace monitors, they send elections monitors, uh, the UN in, is engaged in election prevention violence. So there's this positive aspect of, of focusing on elections. What Kenya clearly showed to us was that if you focus on only the elections and not the root causes, and you only program towards the election date, that you actually can A, undermine positive peace work that was going on, or B, you can create a vacuum that can be, that can be exploited by uh, the authorities that were coming into power. So in the situation of Kenya, uh, the president, in a lot of ways, was using the international attention around uh, the elections to make sure that a lot of people in his party maintained power so that they wouldn't be, have to be charged for crimes in the ICC. Um, it also, the post-elections period caused a lot of violence and the US government was no longer involved in the post-elections period. So clearly what we saw which, of the tragedy and massacre is that the root causes in Kenya are, are still at a tipping point. When I was with our, our Kenyan uh, Friends Church Peace Team colleagues in Bujumbura in September, we had a long interview, we talked for hours and she said, you know, I don't, I don't I, I am very worried about Kenya. I'm very worried about my country. I don't think we're going to make it to the 2017 elections. This was two weeks before the, the, the shooting, at the, the attack at the mall when I was with her. Um, and that's exactly what we're telling the US government about Burundi. And so we are saying when you design a program, we have to make sure that we think about the, the peace consolidation period, which are those critical three months after the elections so one, the, now our, the US government strategy for Burundi, they're, they're using the Complex Crises Fund funding. Um, none of this is 
public yet, but um, they're using the Complex Crises Fund funding <laughs> um, to design programs, and they're going to use the, f the pr they're going to plan for three months after the elections, which they didn't do in Kenya. So it's a direct lesson learned. It has a lot to do with the, the attack. Um, what we're also doing is making sure that the programs, while they while we're using the framing of the elections period, they're addressing root cause issues. So in Kenya, we really focused on elections training, elections monitoring, citizen reporting, kind of built a parallel judicial system um, for v violence reporting. In Burundi, the programs are going to talk, they're going to be doing, doing alternative to violence programs and alternative violence trainings with the elections in mind, but they're talking about youth crime, they're talking about land, they're talking about reconciliation, they're talking about trauma healing. So the thematic issues that we'll be addressing are root cause with the hope that it'll transcend this election period. So I hope that's a that's great. great answer. Right. And then uh, I'm gonna let uh, Matt jump in next for just one moment of his question. Right, yeah, I, I just wanna reiterate one point. Uh, the U.S. military is expanding its operations in Africa. Right now, it's around military assistance, uh, training and advising, equipment, arms deals, some surveillance, drones bases, things like that. Al-Shabaab in Kenya. Uh, we've got Al-Qaeda in, Isla in the Islamic Maghreb. Uh, we have a handful of other groups that the United States alleges are terrorist organizations. And under that auspice, also under the AUMF, we're, we're seeing an expansion of military policy. And I just wanted to mention this because a lot of our U.S. government uh, collaboration with Kenya is militarized. And this really is illustrative of the huge problem we have with a militarized foreign policy. It's not directly connected, but it is certainly tacitly related. And I think we have to think about this. The way the U.S. engages with the world, specifically uh, the way the U.S. Uh, military is engaging in counterterrorism in Africa will have long-term effects on uh, not just the world, Kenyans and others, uh, but also U.S. policy. So, you know, thinking about these things in the broader context as well is very important. David. Um, in terms of the Russian programs, I would say it's a mixture of good and bad news. Um, I'll give you a little anecdote. Uh, back in the Clinton administration, a uh, U.S. government official described a situation where he had, had visited uh, a nuclear weapons research facility outside of Moscow. This is in the uh, Yeltsin administration. It was a three-story brick building that looked like a uh, uh, physics uh, department on a U.S. college campus, is how he described it. He said they went down in the basement and there were these lockers like you would see at, at the gym, and that's where they were storing bomb-grade, highly enriched uranium with little padlocks. And this guy said that his kids' lockers at school were regularly being broken into to steal gym shoes. But in this case, this was bomb-grade nuclear material. And that was how it was secured. And then this guy walked past, decided to walk past the building that evening at 10 o'clock to see what the security was like. He said there was one older woman standing in front of this building, and she was the sole security force for this building, and you see that there were there were t pounds and pounds and pounds of this bomb grade material in the basement. Fast forward to today, we have spent hundreds of millions of dollars uh, increasing the security at facilities in Russia, uh, giving them equipment, providing them with security, uh, in some cases jointly manufacturing security. The that was all done under what was called the Nun Luger program. That program, the agreement between us and Russia expired this year. Uh, it was renegotiated. It's a vastly slimmed down program. Most of the uh, severe problems have been solved. The Russians have a lot more money than they did in the Yeltsin administration. They say that they are going to be able to maintain this equipment and take care of the risks of their own. And frankly, they've gotten tired of the Marikanskis coming over there and poking around in their nuclear weapons sites. Uh, the other program that was ongoing was we were buying, again, bomb-grade uh, uranium from the Russians, downgrading it, bringing it over here, running it through our reactors. About 10% of the electricity today in this room comes from Russian nuclear warheads. Um, and that has been going on for years, and it's called megatons to megawatts. 
That program, the last shipment, is now somewhere in the middle of the Atlantic on the way here. It's going to end at the end of December this year. The Russians have gotten tired of the price that the Americans are willing to give them, and they say they're going to continue selling this stuff on the open market. So it's a little bit of good news, bad news. The Russians, the worst problems are over. The Russian government has a lot more money. We have provided them with a lot of security technology. The real question is, will they uh, maintain their uh, sites at what we would cons consider uh, first class standards? And we don't know. I'll take the uh, rule of law question, but I would like to briefly talk about Nairobi, because I was in Mogadishu in Somalia in August, weeks before the attack at the Westgate Mall. And when I returned, I was there for a week and was fortunate enough to meet with everyone, government, non-government, civil society. Um, when I came back, I was able to write pieces about my experience, articles about my experience for USA Today, Washington Post, CNN, Newsweek, Fox News, and others, talking about why the Shabab exists, the very group that took credit for the Westgate Mall attack, why they exist, why they grow, and sometimes it's as simple as 20 bucks and a cell phone for kids who have no job. How does the US respond to that? Airstrikes, drone strikes, military assistance, like Matt talked about. So if we want to undermine recruitment, if we want to give people an alternative, it's in the softer stuff, and it's building up socioeconomic political path capacity, which the West hasn't done a whole lot of in Somalia. So I write about that. That's on our website. If you go to our homepage, click on Press Room, scroll down, you'll find those five or six articles that delve into essentially why Westgate happened, because Westgate was a Western target. And so it's directly related. Now, to rule of law, it's a great question. I'm going to suggest that folks self-answer that question by looking at the document. Because if I'm just scrolling through the document, and under global cooperation and rule of law, so, to be fair, so we don't get into specifics, I see a lot of, I don't see anything about policing per se, but I see a lot of things about treaties and supporting regional institutions, international institutions, Human Rights Council, Nuclear Test Ban Treaty, UN Convention of Rights of the Child. Some of those treaties the US has not ratified. Um, elimination of all forms of discrimination against women, Mine Ban Treaty. So that when we're, when we're talking about, in this document, when the group is talking about global cooperation, rule of law, and I actually wanna, if you wanna address that question too, you're welcome to, I'm not to put, put you on the spot, or, But what I, what I see in rule of law is I see that. It's, it's a pretty macro, 30,000 foot conversation. I think within the shared security document in the blog, and I would encourage, maybe that's a good question for the blog, for us to engage in the micro. That's the granularity that we need to get into. I see this description barely 30,000 foot at, at the time being. I'll, I'll just <coughs> add that I think this question, I actually think if you look at the top of page 22, there's a, there's a reference to international policing. And I think one of the challenges that, that um, as I've heard people talk about this question of um, how do, how, I mean, if you think about having local police, most of us accept the fact that we have local police forces that provide some level of security. We may not like many of the things that they do, but there's sort of a practice of that. And I think the question that, that concerns us is how um, the security sector overall performs, and I think there are, are valid questions about that in our local communities, but I think there's certainly questions about that on the international level as well. And there is a, a conversation that's also happening about security sector reform and how that can happen in a way that you don't have corrupt police forces that may be instigating violence in some cases. Um, so there's, there's work to do in that area, and I think that was part of what we were thinking of in this document. I want to go on to some more questions or comments. So um, standing here in the back, uh, where are you, Andrew, right here? Take one question here, and then um, uh, go over to Jim. Go ahead. Hi, I'd, I, uh, I'd like to, I really enjoy the document a lot. We had a, ch a chance to talk about it at our uh, Katie Friends meeting. And say uh, your name. Uh, my name is Gray Cox. I'm from Far Harbor, Maine. And um, <clears throat> I'd like to follow up with a sort of, with two questions on, on uh, Michael's uh, an initial framing for our Q&A. One about the general theoretical framework that it offers and one about a specific case. <clears throat> In terms of the, the overall framework, 
there is a concept that um, seemed to me in, in our, our meeting, meetings discussion to be implicit in all the analysis, but not made explicit. Um, it's the notion of a commons. Um, the, as we talked about the document, it seemed that a key part of what it's really trying to do is get people to see that a traditional way of looking at security is in terms of military that occupy territory to control resources. And that the shift is about viewing the world in terms of commons that are shared and that have to be secured through shared security. So but my first question is, were you guys thinking of the term commons? Is it there more than we, we saw? Um, would it be useful? And, and do you find it useful in terms of trying to explicate this notion of shared security? That's a, one question. <clears throat> the second is, um, in terms of a specific example, um, Mexico. It's right on our border. It's a major war. Tens of thousands of people are dying there. And um, it, it, I think you can make a strong case that the U.S. is strongly contributing to it through our um, prohibition of, of, of drugs in this country and the market that we've created that is an irresistible force for the criminalization of, of all sorts of activity in Mexico as well as the rest of Latin America and the transformation of Mexico into a kind of narco-democracy. And I'm wondering if there are ways in which um, using it as an example where uh, an invasion, where drone strikes, where other traditional military attempts to control territory for resources aren't going to work and some notion of viewing our, our um, health, our um, uh, civil society and the like as a commons that requires shared security might, might work. Okay, thanks. Thank uh, Jim? And then the next question will be from a female right up here. <laughs> I'm, I'm really moved by this concept of shared s security and I'm uh, wondering about the, the vision that needs to come behind a shared security and shared vision and um, I'm thinking about this country and the polarization that we're seeing um, in terms of the, the greatest level of uh, governance dysfunction that we've seen maybe in 40 years or longer, uh, the, the lowest point in bipartisanship that many of us have seen in, in, in decades. And, 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 and what um, we have people willing to um, subvert the political process for, for gain. And, and, and I'm just wondering how in a time when, when the United States is, is having a less and less shared vision how uh, we as friends and in here in North America can, 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 can take this global shared vision but also still be aware of the profound weakness we have in this country where, um, I mean, we're, we have extremists waiting for crises to jump on uh, inflamed situations. And, 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 and you can imagine some bad scenarios for, for this country. Um, and where, should, where share, shared security should be in the U.S. context. Okay, thanks, Jim. I'm going to, uh, one up, Andrew, up here, and while you're coming up, um, Jose, I'm going to ask you to take that question, so if you could think for a minute about it, just because I know you're working in sort of a bipartisan way on a very divisive issue. Um, and the other one, I think Michael was specifically addressed to you, so you might want to start thinking about the first questions that came. And let's get one more set of questions back here. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Andrew, that's right. So um, this is maybe not so much a question, but just um, information. My, I'm Lori Childers from Corvallis, Oregon. Um, I worked in Kenya extensively in the 1980s and went back to visit in 2006, which was just after the first election violence, and heard stories of, um, or else I heard on the phone after conversations. But anyway, in the community where we were, which was 30 miles southeast of Nairobi, um, the violence had started in western Kenya. It was starting to spread, and a bunch of people, two or three, I should say, showed up in this community trying to rile people up. And, you know, it had kind of originally been Maasai, but there were a lot of Kikuyus and a lot of different people there. And, and the um, merchants in the community all got together. This is all, you know, in the space of hours and got together and said, you know, we like what goes on here. We like that we get along. We have a good situation here. We don't want this. And they found those people and they said, you know, you're not welcome here. This isn't. This isn't going to fly here. 
you can go away. So those kind of stories, unfortunately, never made it to the news. But they did happen, and I think it's worth checking out the communities where violence didn't happen and find out why. Thank you. I think, I think those stories of civil resistance and sort of civil people acting together are completely compelling. And I, and I think we try to tell some of those through the AFSC profiles in here, but there are many, many more to be told. So I appreciate that. Um, let's go to the first uh, question. And I, I will just also say, um, I mean, someone may want to try to take a pass at the question on Mexico. We are not working specifically in that area, so it's not a policy area of expertise of people at FCNL at this point in time. But Michael, do you want to start by answering the first question about co common, C-O-M-M-O-N-S, correct? Sure, sure. And, and Aura was, you were nodding. Is there anything you want to add to that? Uh, yeah. Okay, so can you stand up and introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Aura Kanagas with the American Friends Service Committee, as folks said, and one of the um, drafters of the document. And uh, we were thinking about the commons. We talked about the commons, and um, and it was talked about, I think, in our in our convening of friends that seasoned the initial document. So um, that was implicit in the document, and it was good that you picked it up. Um, we in a couple of different places, and this speaks to the policing question. We we really worked to sort of speak to the conversation where it is now, with our vision, um, uh, looking looking out to where we needed to get, and I I think something that we um, with, with the term policing, it's a good place where you see that we have infused a militaristic approach to how we think about security from the personal to the community to the global. Um, and there's nothing inherently wrong with a, a rule of law and a collective sense of what the rules are and how we will approach them together, but it's, it's how we have applied it as a society that takes it away from that peace building framework. Um, so I, one thing that we're working on now, uh, jointly again, AFSC and FCNL, is are exploring uh, um, a domestic version of the, the shared security working paper that, that looks at some of the many domestic policy applications where this also fits, um, and, and that is, a, is one of those. Um, and I will just say quickly about the border, that AFSC is, um, is um, working on a joint U.S.-Mexico border program um, that brings back some of the threads of work that we've had for many years, but looking at exactly what you raised. Um, we just had a, a Google Hangout, that was my first experience, on, on, the, uh, on boots on the border, that was looking at border militarization with the U.S.-Mexico Mex border. Um, so in many of these areas, AFSC and FCNL, I think, are, are really finding our, our, our feet in collaboration and, and um, working more effectively with each other, and it's been exciting to be a part of that, and I, I thank Diane for that. Thank you, Aura. I'll just, can I just add one thing? Yeah. Because um, n not to contradict Aura, but just to <laughs> compliment. Um, I, on the Hill at least, I think the onus is on us to, to build a bridge. I like what Reza said yesterday, we are the bridge. Um, with shared security, it takes some creative bridge building here because <laughs> you're dealing with a lot of people who are born and raised, bred in the realpolitik thinking. So, how do you shift paradigms without using too much jargon or too many new worldviews or frames and just lose them in that process? Um, I think if we spell out what a society or an environment looks like in a non-shared non security framework, then they might get it. Per my earlier point, do we want everyone in the world with drones? No. So what do we do to have a shared security framework to address that. Do we want loose nukes floating around everywhere? No. Now, the USG, the US government, tends to approach that conversation pretty imperialistically in the sense that, well, it's okay for a few of us to have it, but the rest of the world can't. So we have to, we have to work with that. That's a, that's a tough battle, we gotta do it. Um, but I think increasingly, as the world becomes even more interconnected as weapons become even more trafficked and available, we're gonna have to weigh in on uh, a shared security framework. So for me, commons doesn't resonate, but I'm not, I, I certainly support people using it, but I do think we have to be very careful about using too much jargon in a conversation with congressional staff where they could, they could shut off. So how do we build that bridge smartly and carefully? So um, I think that I'd like to ask Jose, and then there might be somebody else. I don't know, Tila, do you want to address the, the, the other one, the question about given how divided we are as a country, 
if I'm understanding correctly, politically and the sort of gap and the big chasm of our ability to even kind of come together and think of our own shared future and security, how do we, how do we embrace that? And um, because this is quite honestly something that we think a lot about and work a lot on. So do you want to take a, a first hit of that? Sure. Um, the first um, response I had, first thought I had to your question was um, to um, read Parker Palmer's book, Healing the Heart of Democracy. Um, Parker is a Quaker, and we were hoping to get him. We hopefully will get him at one of our annual meetings. Um, and that's about seeing the disarray that our political system is in and feeling heartbroken about it, but heart, your heart breaking open, not just shattering on the ground, and, and re-evaluating at your core what it is that you, we need to do to heal our own hearts in order to carry this nation forward. Um, and so we, this is an incredibly politically sophisticated audience, so it's a little intimidating always talking to you. Um, <laughs> but um, we know the, the, the political dysfunction, some of the root causes, the gerrymandering, uh, the fact that politicians spend 60% um, you know, of their time fundraising, um, the fact uh, based on uh, a YouTube that Matt showed me um, by Lawrence Lessig, which said that 60% of all super PAC money in the 2012 presidential elections came from 142 people. So, so we are close to an oligarchy. Um, however, we are still a democracy. And hearkening to um, uh, Bill Moyers' <laughs> adage, the only antidote to organized money is organized people, you are the role model for these organized people. We need the world to replicate who you are throughout American society. Heartbreaking open means replicating what it is that you do with every single citizen um, of this nation to realize the depths, of, um, the depths of our systemic problems and to use our voice as the American people the fundamental heart of democracy to lift us out of this dysfunction and to talk about a shared future. Um, I was in one of, the, one of the lobbying meetings that I was in, Senator Menendez, um, uh, the staffer was saying, we need more people like you just to affirm what we're doing. You know, there's a lot of organization on the other side just pounding and pounding and pounding them. Um, and the Democrats, we sort of, or I'm sorry, no, not the Democrats, uh, those um, who, who our kinds of positions, many people just sort of assume, well, either they're, they're for it and so we, they don't, we, need, we don't need to talk to them or they're so fundamentally against it we don't need to talk to them. They need to hear from us and from American people how much they support peace and democracy and getting rid of the military budget. So we need to continue this exercise and to encourage our neighbors to do the same. Um, so it starts at this sort of fundamental level of how we heal. And then lastly, one of the top value, one of the top issue priorities that you came up with is campaign finance reform. And this is really at the root cause, and I know that um, Matt and um, David have been working on this, and Ruth as well. Maybe they can talk a little bit about those efforts. Okay, I'm going to ask um, all of the lobbyists to be a little bit more brief in uh -huh. your responses, and I'm going to ask all of the questioners to be a little bit more brief in your responses so we can come back to a couple of other people. So anyone have a burning thing they need to say on this panel that hasn't spoken recently? Tila? I'll just, I'll just speak to the um, question about how does uh, shared security fit into the U.S. context and the bipartisanship, the lack of bipartisanship. I think um, there, it's no secret that there is a bunch of congressional gridlock uh, going on right now, and I think a lot of that stems around the budget issue and the budget work that I do. But um, what I'm seeing now, I'll just share one uh, anecdote from just working on the military budget. Over the past couple years, it's, we're, I've seen it change from asking if we can cut the military budget to how much it can be cut. And I've seen that um, pool of members of Congress who said, you know, there's no way that the military budget can be cut. I've seen that kind of dwindling as... Uh, as, as I've been going through this work, and that's kind of monumental. So um, while it, it is really difficult, but I, there, there is hope there. There's glimmers. So. All right, Kate gets to say one brief thing. 
super PACs didn't cause the phone lines of Capitol Hill to melt down during the Syria vote. And just that, you know, super PACs didn't, <laughs> talk to you all. Um, and they didn't flood the town hall, you know, the town halls with, with people like you. Um, and they didn't change the decisions of our president and secretary of state and all these people um, and members of Congress. So uh, that was people power. Okay, let's go back to some more questions. Uh, Kara, uh, Andrew, can you want to, yeah, uh, Kara right here. And then uh, we'll go over here. And then do we have anyone, any young adults who would like to ask a question? <laughs> Kara, go ahead. Uh, quick question, Kate. Uh, you talked about what's going on with uh, um, Rouhani and all of that, which is very exciting. But you didn't say anything about uh, Netanyahu and Israel and where that might, what we might be doing in that regard. Okay. Within yes. that context. Thank you. Yep. You got to put it right up to your mouth. Anything? Okay, just loud. Project. There. Okay. <laughs> Iran has a new leader. What are the next steps that you may see in terms of making contact, lowering tension? Great. So, a couple, uh, two questions for Kate on Netanyahu and Iran. Anybody back there? You guys awake back there? Okay. All right. We got one right here, uh, Alicia. Straight. No, back on this aisle, Alicia. Alicia, right here, down that aisle. The man with his hand up. Thank you. Hey, Keith Barton from Berkeley. Um, you uh, talked about the destabilization of Syria due to the influx of people from the countryside during a major drought. Um, another aspect, an another issue is uh, the growth, uh, population growth rate in Kenya uh, and uh, Rwanda. I believe before the massacres in Rwanda, there was a lot of. Uh, the, the, the population growth was tremendous. And if you see the projections of the population growth in Kenya, it's uh, uh, you know, daunting. Uh, and obviously, if that's combined with the drought, you're going to have quite a bit of ethnic conflict. Uh, it's also very difficult to talk about family planning in that country. Um, so I'm, I'm curious, if you, curious if you have any thoughts. OK. Kate, you want to respond first, and then? Yes, well, so that historic nuclear deal that I told you we're on the cusp of, uh, some people aren't happy about it. And there are people in Congress that aren't happy about it. There are people in Iran who aren't happy about it. Um, there's Benjamin Netanyahu, Prime Minister of Israel, who's not so happy about it. Um, I think, so he is, he's trashed the deal from the beginning, actually just, you know, trashed the idea of talking to Iran at all. And in doing so, contra he's contradicting a lot of his advisors and some, um, you know, various uh, Israeli security officials who have said, we should support these diplomatic efforts. It's good for everyone. It's good for stability in the Middle East. There's news today about how the Israeli government is actually moving ahead with um, lifting the, uh, or, sorry, with, with stopping the distribution of gas masks in Israel. So um, you may remember when we were seeing the headlines about how the U.S. was going to start bombing on Thursday, on uh, bombing Syria, then the, um, there were all these gas masks distributed all over Israel. People were terrified, um, understandably, thinking that there would be some kind, after the U.S. would start bombing, then there'd be a retaliatory attack uh, against Israel. And, um, it, in, and perhaps even retaliatory chemical weapons attacks. Well, now that this diplomatic deal with the Russians, with these people who are, with this government um, that's one of the Syrian regime's closest allies, now that that deal is making so much progress in peacefully disarming Syria of its poison gas, then they're understanding that, well, they don't need to distribute gas masks anymore. So it, this, um, people are breathing easier across the region, and, uh, and it's good to hear. <laughs> I did not mean that to be a pun. It just came out. Um, so, you know, about the, the next steps with Rouhani. Um, well, the next steps, 
uh, you know, be, tune in for Wednesday. There is going to be a lot to watch for with these negotiations between the U.S. and Iran on um, the nuclear deal in, on, in Geneva. So the first step is to go forward with a deal. The U.S. and Iran had pretty much agreed on a deal. And then um, other players, the French and others, you know, got in the way of that. But um, they, they could go forward with this deal. It would freeze Iran's nuclear, uh, nuclear program in place, and it would uh, allow for some modest sanctions relief. That's the first step in de-escalating tensions. Then from there, we can look at a, a comprehensive agreement um, to, uh, you know, to, to have this, this long-term strategy of preventing a nuclear-armed Iran and preventing war and then, and then look at other implications for U.S.-Iran diplomacy. Talk to Iran about Syria. Engage Iran on Syria. Right now, the Obama administration says Iran can't join the talks, the Geneva II process on Syria, until they um, sign up for these certain preconditions. But we need Iran, just like we needed the, Russia, the Russians to get a chemical weapons deal, we need Iran's influence on the Syrian regime to get a ceasefire to help end the conflict. So, brief question about Kenya population resource availability. Do you want to take that, Madeline, or yeah. okay? Um, yeah, no, it's it's absolutely a, a huge issue and something that's on our mind. I think um, the U.S. foreign policy apparatus towards Sub-Saharan Africa is pretty much on three tracks. There is the uh, few conflict-focused countries that have a lot of attention. So there's a lot of there's a big constituency for DRC. There's a big constituency for Sudan and South Sudan. There's now a big constituency for for Mali. A lot of engagement in Mali. So these kind of these these conflicts that have been ongoing and long term and have a, a, enough members of Congress that know what's going on there and pay attention to them. Then there is sort of the new generation of folks who are trying to talk about Africa on the rise and the growing economic development of Africa and that Africa is in this new paradigm of development and we need to trade and, and open trade and with the TPP talk about opening markets and engage them as partners, um, not paying attention to the, uh, the underlying ethnic tensions that are still very ripe. Um, and then there is kind of the third track, which is the increasing militarization and the encroachment of the DOD uh, into uh, humanitarian space, into trade space, into these markets, and the, the really huge shift we're seeing. Um, FCNL is trying to kind of forge a, a new path and talk about the underlying tensions of root causes that you cannot just proceed to in, engage in development and or in trade activities if you're not addressing the root causes of the conflict that are going to potentially undermine those those prospects or, or relationships down the line. Um, and I think what you know what you talked about there's a, a, a exacerbating line and connecting a connection between resource scarcity, population growth, youth bulge, unemployment, political centralization, and lack of access to political uh, opportunity that are all inter interacting uh, in a big way, uh, particularly in the Horn of Africa, as you mentioned. Um, and we currently have a, a new fellow on staff who is unfortunately not here, uh, but she's a new Scoville fellow who just completed um, a, a uh, Fulbright in uh, water scarcity and water and confl resource conflict at the uh, Peace Research Institute of Oslo, and then did a master's at uh, Oxford in water scarcity. And so we're currently building a campaign around uh, talking about the undercurrents of resource scarcity and population growth and how that fits into the political system and how we engage. Um, yeah, so, so we, we are definitely working on it. I'm going to give Matt Southworth the last word on the shared security panel because he's been uncharacteristically quiet tonight. <laughs> you know, no one asked me a question, so I, I couldn't talk. But, you know, <laughs> we all know I love to talk, so here I am again. Now, this is my ninth annual meeting, but my first with a beard. Um, so I'm trying really hard to fit in. Yeah, I know it's a, it is a very unbiased crowd when it comes to beards, right? Yeah. <laughs> So, I was born in 1984. Uh, let that sink in for just a second, 1984. I was raised by absolute savages. Uh, they threw plastic in the ocean. They used leaded gas. They drove Ford Pintos. Uh, I mean, they put DDT in, uh, in bug spray, you know? Um, so this really gets to the question that was asked earlier about the commons. It gets to the question about political divisiveness. Really, we need to elect the next generation of leaders because the same people who are running the country right now put the DDT in the bug spray. They sprayed the, you know, there's Monsanto spraying Agent Orange over Vietnam and so on and so forth. So I think one of the things we can do when looking at this document and thinking about the future of our work individually, collectively, and so on 
take this document, read it, bring it to your communities, think about ways that what you're doing can be reflected in it, but also engage with us. Engage with us in February over the President's Day recess. Uh, engage with us in March for the Young, Young Adult Spring Lobby Weekend. And engage with us in all the time in between. We have a lot of pressing issues to work on. Preventing wars, ending wars, uh, bookending the global war on terror, getting Congress to acknowledge climate change. That's a step in the right direction. Uh, all of these things will take work. They take us working together. They especially take you. I only have as much influence as I have constituents backing me up. Uh, I had a meeting yesterday with Adam Smith, uh, the ranking member on the House Armed Service Committee, with Jonathan Brown, who was his constituent. That would not have been possible. The conversation would not have happened if it was just me going into the office. I would have met with a mid-level staffer. But instead, I sat across from the member. That is the power you have when you come here, when you lobby in districts, when you write, when you call, and we need it. We need you. Uh, whether it's shared security, electing the next generation of leaders, or anything in between. So thank you. I applaud you all. We applaud you all for your work. Uh, we hope that you'll continue to engage with us.